Um, Todd um, has led the department's Pacific herring stock assessment efforts in the Southern Salish Sea since 2015 and also coordinates studies focused on the biology and ecology of other forage fish species. He has been a field biologist for 23 years, studying juvenile salmonid biology, disease ecology, and fish community trophic interactions in the upper and lower Columbia River, the San Juans, Grays Harbor, as well as throughout the Southern Salish. Prior to moving to Washington in 2010, Todd worked at the Hatfield Marine Science Center at Oregon State, where he went to sea aboard commercial fishing vessels, vessels for seven summers and participated in the Columbia River Plume Study and GLOBEC, which is the Global Ocean Ecosystems Dynamics, a study of the Northern California Current. Currently lives in Forest Park with his wife, Julie Keister, and uh, who is a biological oceanographer at the University of Washington. So please welcome Todd, Ted. Todd, excuse me. <laughs> And let's see if I can get back to you. Anybody know what that little thing on the left there is? I was going to say it's funny lung sucker. Close. It's a larval mola mola. Oh. oh. Larval mola mola. Which I've never actually seen. I think it's pretty cool. <laughs> Pacific sunfish is mola mola. It's one of the most, most strange fish we have. I think. <laughs> All right. Everyone hear me okay in the back? Um, thanks for having me up here. I am, uh, well, many of you probably know Kurt Stick, who was my predecessor at the department for 30 years, 25 years anyway. I'm um, now retired. And so I'm down at the Mill Creek office, which is region four. And I will, I can only really highlight things on the nearest screen. So apologies for you looking at that one over there. Um, <clears throat> let's talk forge fish. All right, so what are they? They are an ecological group, not genetically related, meaning they're not a family of fish or even an order of fish. They're basically planktivores, small silvery schooling fish that get preyed upon for their entire life cycle. So they don't outgrow their predators uh, ever, which means they, have, they suffer intense mortality. Um, planktivores, well, I'll talk about plankton more in a second. Um, obviously, they are a vital conduit between primary production levels and larger organisms like salmon and orcas. Um, they are also one of our Puget Sound partnership vital signs for ecosystem health because they're so fundamental to the, to the food web. And they're also commercial, recreationally, and culturally important. And so this number used to be even higher, but currently forage fish make up about 50% of the global marine harvest of fishes. Uh, and it was even higher back before the Peruvian anchovy fishery crashed off of Chile. So um, let's see what I have going on here. So in Washington State, we have a couple of different categories. We have pelagic spawners, which are anchovy and sardines. Uh, we, I'll talk a, very briefly about anchovy because they've been upticking in the blob era. Uh, warm water benefits them. Uh, we have sardines on the coast and sometimes in the Strait of Juan de Fuca, but rarely inside the Salish Sea. And I will use Salish Sea and Puget Sound sometimes interchangeably as I'm still transitioning. That's an anchovy with the undercut jaw. Pretty, pretty easy to identify. Then we have our anadromous spawners, like salmon. These are fish that spend most of their lives in marine environment, but spawn in fresh water. That includes Ulicon smelt, AKA candlefish, uh, a whole slew of other acronyms, um, hooligans, and those are now ESA listed. We only have very small populations of those in the Skagit, and sometimes we bump into them in the Strait of Juan de Fuca, but not much elsewhere. Uh, and then we have longfin smelt. And as you probably know around here, there's a run in the Nooksack, there's also a landlocked run in Lake Washington, and they used to be, of course, widespread everywhere, but those are pretty much the two remaining populations, uh, large populations. And then we have our nearshore spawners. So this is where we're gonna spend most of our time today. Uh, these are our big three, and I'm gonna actually start with surf smelt and sand lance because we know less about them, and then I'll move to herring, uh, and then I will talk about cherry point herring, which I'm sure you're all interested in. So if you, want, if you have questions as we're going, please do ask. But if it's a really complicated question, I might put it off to the end because I don't want to use up uh, all the time. So anyway, um, and then the, the other thing that's worth knowing is there's a bunch of other stuff that, that is in the Salish Sea, like squid and stickleback and shiner perch and larval hake and all kinds of stuff that can be forage fish but are not typically considered forage fish. 
And that's because they tend to be benthic once they're adults, so they're on the bottom. And obviously squid are not fish, but they're eating at the same level in the ecosystem. So things like squid and jellyfish are competing with forage fish and also with juvenile salmon for their food source. And their food source we're going to talk about next. Oh, I have this slide I threw in just for this. OK, this is the Puget Sound food web over the last year. Um, but increasingly, this, this piece of the puzzle, forage fish, is starting to be included in that discussion. And that's really encouraging, because I worked in salmon biology and ecology for 17 years, and nobody talked about this. It was very frustrating. Um, so we're starting to take a look at that. And if we're going to look at that, it's worth looking at the rest of it. So here's the, here's the big picture. We're looking at energy flow on the left axis. And of course, the biomass is the width of the pyramid block. It starts with phytoplankton. These are the marine plants, typically single-celled. They're using the sun for energy. Um, and they are eaten by zooplankton, which I will talk about in the next slide a little bit. Zooplankton are all the little things out there that fish eat uh, and jellyfish eat. And then, hold on, we have forage fish. Don't, you didn't see that. that was the, that's, the, that's the good part of the slide. We have forage fish, and then we have all the other fish that eat forage fish, which is pretty much everything. Uh, and seabirds, and at the top, the marine mammals, the color scheme there is not a coincidence, but um, it's also dolphins, porpoises, seals, sea lions, uh, whales like humpback whales, and of course orcas. So that's how the energy flows. And it's really cool to see, uh, recently there, there was a special on National Geographic about the sea wolves up in British Columbia. The wolves actually go down to the coast and eat herring spawn when that happens. And they've also seen bears doing the same thing. Bears will actually catch the herring, but they'll also eat the spawn. So it's a, it's a really important food source late in the winter when there's not a lot else to eat. And everything, everything comes to dine when the herring spawn. OK, so a slight explanation for how this cycle works in this neck of the woods. When I say Southern Sail Sea, what I'm about to say really pertains to Puget Sound proper, because we're in the southern strait of Georgia, and things are much more fluid here uh, with the Fraser River input. But big picture, what happens is, um, obviously, phytoplankton needs sunlight to grow. So in the wintertime, there are very low levels, so there's very little food for everything else. Uh, when spring hits, we have these storms in the wintertime, it mixes the water calm. So in the water calm, the deep stuff tends to have more nutrients, because nothing is really Everything that dies sinks to the bottom and decomposes. So the deep water is nutrient rich. You have winter storms, mix that up. That stuff comes to the surface. Spring hits, you got sunlight, boom, phytoplankton bloom. So that happens. And then shortly after that, you get a zooplankton bloom, which eats the phytoplankton. And that timing is really important. We'll come back to this at the end. I talk a little bit about climate change. That time is critical because that is the food for forage fish. And they, they, obviously, they hatch out. They have a few days to start feeding, or else they starve to death. So, in Puget Sound, and in most of the Salish Sea, Hood Canal falls in the same category, there's a big bloom in the spring. Then the phytoplankton actually use up the nutrient levels in the surface waters. We have our spring thaw. We have a bunch of fresh water floods the system and stratifies the water column. So it's not mixing anymore because the winds tend to be less intense during the summertime than the wintertime. So there's actually this lull in the summer. Not that things aren't growing. There's still little, little potches here and there. But overall, the big bloom has already happened. And in the fall, this fall is a bit of an anomaly, but you have big storms again, mixes the water calm, there's still not enough sunlight, and you get a secondary bloom in the fall. So that's the general pattern. All right, so zooplankton. This is what my wife studies. Uh, a huge diversity of organisms here, everything from crab megalope. These come out in the early summer. That's also a favorite fruit item for salmon. Uh, we have euphosids, which are krill. Copepods, largest biomass on Earth of any invertebrate organism right there. Um, this is a marine, this is a pteropod, it's a marine snail. Uh, and then of course larval fish, when they first hatch out, they swim very poorly as I'm about to show you. And so they're actually considered zooplankton because zooplankton means drifting with the current more or less. Um, and until they learn how to swim, they get big enough to swim and settle out it's called. They're considered zooplankton as well. So, um, lots of these categories, these, the top row and these guys, very negatively affected by ocean acidification because it interferes with their ability to uptake calcium from seawater. And I'll talk about that more at the end. OK, so here's a, a very short video. I, this is, I find this endlessly fascinating. We think about fish around here. We think about salmon. Salmon are cool. Uh, you think about salmon leaping up waterfalls. And fish, obviously, are good swimmers. But when fish are really small, it's a totally different story. And that's because of a, an effect called Reynolds numbers, which I can't even try to begin to explain to you. But basically, 
When you're small, the water is viscous, and you have what's called a boundary layer. So this fish, we're going to see in the video, I have to start it first. Um, this is a, a larval fish trying to eat zooplankton. That's all the black dots. And you'll see that it's struggling to move through the water. Uh, I don't see it. There we go. OK, here we go. So he's coming in on it. Da -da 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 -da. OK? And that's the boundary layer of water. It's so dense, or that proportional to the size of the fish, he's just pushing the, the food away. OK? So that fish could potentially starve to death. And then here's another. There's been a couple of really cool papers on this. Um, if it will forward. There we go. OK. So this is another paper that came out in 2014. And this is, um, sorry, Eleanor, I'm beating your remote up here. Um, again, so this fish, you can see this, the gut has developed more. So this is an older fish. There's more musculature in the spine. And then the tail is bigger. It's pointed right at us. It's in plane, so it's hard to see. But these things indicate that it's an older fish. It's a little bit bigger. And when it goes to feed, boom, right? So that's what larval fish have to overcome. Now, for herring, herring eggs are laid in, in the, around this neck of the woods. The water temperature is somewhere around 12 to 14 degrees Celsius. They, have, they hatch out in about 12 to 14 days. They have five days to start feeding, or they starve to death. And so that, for all forage fish, all pelagic forage fish, that's an incredibly important step. They, that, the year class, the recruitment of a year class is set during that phase. OK. So moving on. OK, so I'm going to talk about big three. As I indicated, I'm going to race through, uh, hopefully not race through, but move quickly through. These are surf smelt, sand lance, and then we'll spend some time here in herring. Um, this diagram indicates where they spawn. Smelt are up here in the sand gravel mix. Sand lance like a little bit sandier. And then herring spawn typically spawn on aquatic vegetation, although they'll spawn on pilings and rocks and whatever they have to spawn on. Um, in our neck of the woods, that's usually about 20 feet, minus 20 feet. Limited by the sunlight. Obviously, the sunlight has to penetrate the water to grow the aquatic vegetation. Otherwise, there's nothing for them to spawn on. But actually, in Hood Canal, where the water's clearer, that sometimes sees uh, vegetation and spawn down 40 feet deep. OK, so surf smelt. Um, these are fishes that live two to three years. They're repeat spawners. Um, they're spining. I showed you where they spawn there. Uh, we have a recreational and a commercial fishery for smelt in Washington State. Um, and we really haven't done that much work with smelt yet, but it looks like preliminary genetics suggest a northern and southern division uh, very loosely. And that, is, that corresponds with their spawn timing. Um, and then one of our real questions is we're trying to manage, we manage two fisheries for smelt, and we don't have any idea how many smelt there are. Um, the one thing that you hear from everyone who does research is there's a ton of smelt. If you put a beach stain out, this is a beach stain. Um, if you put a beach stain out, you're going to get a lot of smelt, especially in the summertime. So they don't seem to be limited, but of course, we don't want to use our ignorance to overharvest them. So there's a 60,000 year quota, pounds per year quota, on smelt right now, uh, which was reduced from a few years ago. OK, so what we do know is where they spawn. And this is work that Dan Pantilla, I don't know if that name rings bells with you all, but he's been doing this, he's still doing this for a long time. Um, and the benefit of identifying where on the beach they're spawning is that there are laws to protect those areas from development, which is important because they don't just spawn anywhere. And the same thing with herring is there's a ton of habitat, but they don't just use any habitat. And we don't know why they use what they use. This map is available online. I'll show you a link here in a second. This is everywhere in the state of Washington that we found smelt spawning. Um, over 250 miles of beach so far. And here's the division I was talking about in terms of Northern ones tend to spawn in, the, spawn in the summer. These guys tend to spawn in the wintertime. And this is not Camino Island, but uh, this is us setting a beach stain. So Camino Island's a hot spot for smelt. And mo like, something like 80% of the commercial fishery takes place right there. Um, I'm not sure why that's a hot spot. I think there's probably several hot spots that we don't know about. But this one's sort of a historic one. So this is uh, Camino. This is Whidbey. And so we went in here uh, two years ago and captured 10,000 smelt and tagged them to try to do a marker capture study, where we can then estimate how many there are based on how many we got back. So we tag them with this, uh, they're called VIE tags. It's an elastic polymer that's fluorescent, but it, it's theoretically non-toxic, which is important because people eat smelt. And if you shine a UV light on them, they fluoresce like this. So we tagged 10,000 smelt, 
And then the commercial fishery started, and we came back out with our seines, and we seined for like two weeks, and we recaptured 21 smelt, which is just enough to tell you that you just wasted your time tagging 10,000 smelt. Uh, oh, you have a needle. It's actually a, it's a liquid, and when you inject it, it, it solidifies just under the skin. Um, so there's multiple explanations for that. One of them is um, that this area is very, it's a lot of currents moving through here, so maybe they're highly mobile and they're just not there when we go back to catch them again. Another possibility is that there's so many smelt that 10,000 is a drop in the bucket and we didn't get enough tag to know. Uh, another possibility is the fishery took a bunch, although theoretically the fishers were looking for them. Um, and yeah, so basically we didn't learn a whole lot. We learned we had to tag more smelt. So uh, I'm going to move to Sandlands now. We're actually going to do another smelt tagging project starting this summer, much larger scale, and we're hoping to get an answer for how many there are. Uh, Sandlands, an enigma to fisheries biologists. They don't have a gas bladder, so when you're out in your boat and you have your fish sounder going and you see fish and it beeps at you, that's really bouncing off the fish's gas bladder, which, which sends back a signal to the boat, right? So, and that's how they tell you, like, small fish, big fish, which I think is usually false advertising in my personal experience, but uh, these guys don't have a gas bladder, and that's because they live in the sand, and uh, they would be disadvantageous to try to burrow into the sand if you had a gas bladder. Um, they're also very thin, so they're really hard to capture in nets. They just go right through most nets, and if you put out a net that's fine enough to capture them, it's really, really hard to pull that net ashore, I can tell you. Um, and then they spend most of the winter in a, a fish form of hibernation in the deep sea. I'll talk about uh, the San Juan wave channel in a second, but they're out in deep water. There's a bunch of deep sea sand field waves uh, out by in the, in the San Juans, and there's millions of sand lands out there, but it's hard to study them. So this is a map now of spawning. Again, the one thing we know about them is where they spawn. So those are all the areas we found them. Um, they spawn in wintertime, and then they... The sand, the, this channel right here, San Juan Channel, estimated to have 80 million sand lance there in the wintertime. The summertime, we don't really know. There, there's, there's, there are still some there, but they seem to just break up and spread out. And of course, they're spawning inshore. So they're going, some of them are going other places. Right now, um, we actually have a genetic study going, just beginning on that, to try to figure out, are they one big population or are they actually separate populations? Um, and also, just point out, favorite food of juvenile Chinook and rhinoceros auklets. Also very calorie rich, yeah. Uh, speaking of uh, deep wave or uh, deep, deep water sand uh, waves, uh, wasn't there some discovered down in Nisqually also uh, back in 2012? Yeah. Um, yes, that's true. There's one down in Nisqually. There's, I think the paper by, um, by Green identified 23 other ones up north in the southern strait of Georgia. So. I don't know that we've looked hard elsewhere in, in Maine Basin, but yeah, there's a few other ones around. And basically, th these are glacial deposits of sand, as far as I understand it, that are maintained by currents. So you have to have a pretty strong current running through to clean away all the fine debris. And they, they're very particular about the, the grain density and uh, where they'll go in, because obviously, if the grain size isn't right, there isn't water moving through it, there's no oxygen for them. So they're still getting oxygen, even though they're in the sand. This is a, a photo from Dan Pinto. This is a sand lance pit, spawning pit. Uh, you see the pencil on the left, that gives you a sense of scale. And when we collect these egg samples, we take them back to the lab and we look at them under a microscope. And you can identify sand lance because they're very sticky. They use a coated in gravel or pieces of sand, sand, I guess, at this scale. Um, whereas surf smelt don't collect sand. And then there's, there's a bunch of other fish. There's a couple different soles that spawn inshore, but they typically have a spine on their egg, and so you can tell them apart. Uh, I mentioned that the genetics project, I should give a shout out to our collaborators here. We have students at um, Shoreline Community College, the ORCA program at Everett Community College, and then collaborators at NOAA, uh, Friday Harbor Labs, and DFO Canada, Department of Fish Ocean Canada. So the whole Salish Sea now, we're getting samples for these guys. And this is the link that I promised you a little while ago. This is uh, an online map that's updated about every three months. Uh, we just redid our web page and lots of things are broken. So the easiest way to find this, <laughs> that's our answer to redoing our web page, is just break all the links. Um, this is, the easiest way to find this is to just search 
you know, DFW forage fish speed spawning. You'll get there. It's on the bottom of the page. Um, and this actually has information. It's difficult to see at this scale, but the green is herring. Um, and then there's like these little purple patches and stuff. And that, if you zoom in, you can see exactly where we have detected spawn in the past for all three species. When do they spawn? Uh, fall spawners. Fall, early winter. Okay, so now we're at herring, um, which is good. Uh, this is a photo from Jackson Cove in Hood Canal this past winter. This is herring spawning event. Uh, really cool. This is a drone shot. And uh, not our drone, I should say. We don't have one yet. Um, but this is the kind of stuff that you see in Alaska, where they've got a ton of herring. This is very infrequent. This is what Cherry Point would have used to look like back in the day. A lot of herring make that much spawn. Um, so our questions every year are how many how many herring are there? Because we have a very small commercial fishery for herring. But increasingly, our interest is in how many are there because we're now starting to plug the herring data into these larger ecosystem models. This is the, one of the best data sets we have in the state of Washington, 46 years for Cherry Point. Um, those long-term data sets are invaluable. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit here about where they tend to be and then what causes mortality. So just to give you a, a sense of scale, this is herring populations on the West Coast. This is Washington. Oregon's even lower than us. We're orders of magnitude smaller than both North and California has a lot of herring, too, although this is shrinking over time. Um, I'm not sure why that is, but it's important to, to note that even as our herring are declining, herring populations in British Columbia right now are near all-time highs. And that's just, you know, just up the road, so to speak. And we don't know why that's happening. Todd? Yes. Um, you may be planning to address this, but would, uh, but would water temperatures be pushing them north? Uh, we don't know. It's, again, it's a, it's a lack of a long-term data set. There's a few places, a few of the lighthouses up in British Columbia have good long-term temperature data. But it's a little bit screwed up because they used to do it on a tidal cycle. So I don't know. It's, we're, that's something we're looking at. We're looking actually at spawn timing and temperature. Um, the theory is that this is somehow climate, it's a climate signal, but I don't think anyone's figured it out yet. Todd? Yes. Um, are they genetically distinct from the herring that spawn in Taylor? They are. So they have, um, interestingly, Canada treats all their herring as one giant population, but they actually know genetically there's five regional populations, but their regions are very far apart. So there's like a Haida Gwaii population. There's a northern strait of Georgia. So they're separated enough in space that they don't really need to worry about managing them differently. Uh, and they have very active fisheries. They still have a spawn on kelp fishery, which is uh, lucrative, but puts a hit on the fish for sure. OK, so here are our stocks. We, we manage this as 21 separate stocks. Thank you. I need to <laughs> kick things into gear a little bit. Good pointing finger. <laughs> um, okay, so we have, <laughs> traditionally we've had three stocks. Uh, are, we have 21 different places where herring spawn and we check on them all every year. But genetically there's three stocks. Cherry Point, very distinct. Squawks and Pass, uh, considered distinct, although there's, we're ongoing research with UW right now that's calling that into question. And then everybody else gets lumped into all other stocks. So this blue line is all other stocks. The red line's Cherry Point. You see the dramatic declines pretty much before 2000. We lost all that by 2000. Since then, up and down, but recently going down. And actually, this year, they went up 9%. That's not a victory, but they actually went up in number, so that's encouraging. Um, here I broke out the Hood Canal. The Quilcene Bay stock, the last five years, has been going crazy. Um, it's hence that picture I showed you of Jackson Cove. And they. You can see the average for them is about 3,000 tons, metric tons. They're well above that, and then they crashed back down this past year. They had 49% drop, and they're still half of all the herring in Puget Sound, or the whole the Southern Sea Sea, is in Hood Canal. So that kind of thing is normal for forage fish. They have this incredible variability, but uh, I wish we had a better answer for why that happened. Yeah? How far do they roam between spawning and coming back? So good question. Um, the South Sound stocks are, tend to be resident, and we know that from toxics. I'll talk about that in a second. And everybody else up here and up here, most of them go out to the west coast of Vancouver Island in the summertime to feed because there's better food out there. The exception is the Cherry Point fish. We don't know where they go. 
And that's one of our big questions. Because they don't have the same toxic profile as the ones that go out to uh, West Coast Vancouver Island. Does, does the decline in the cherry point population correlate with the expansion of that industrial area there? <laughs> I thought that question would be asked. Um, actually, I have a slide on that at the end. But interestingly enough, it's not, it, there's no, it's not a, an obvious explanation. And I think, I think honestly, the, the best explanation is the fisheries. I have a slide on fisheries here. I'll show you in a second. Michael. Uh, uh, just for amusement's sake, you could also correlate the decline of the herring with the invasion of sargassum. You could do that, and you could probably make a correlation with the salmon fishery too. I mean, lots of things went down at the same time. Um, anyway, so I think, okay, this is spawn timing. Next, we're coming up on the other slide. Anyway, this, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here, but these are south to north. These are all of our stocks. Um, the light green is we found spawn. The dark red is peak spawning. And then the, the dark green boxes are changes. And we see some of the stocks now in the last, and it, it's even changed since this. Last year, Semiyamu spawned the first week of January. So we'll be out there the first week of January this year because we like to get a zero to make sure we're getting all the spawn. So the general pattern has been they tend to be spawning late, at least in the last year. But overall, it bounces around. And we look at this looking for some kind of climate signal. And we haven't found one. OK, so how do we know all this? We do two different kinds of surveys. Uh, the, the ones that we're still doing are the spawn deposition surveys. We call them rake surveys because we use a rake. And it's two of us in a 14-foot boat. And we drag this thing behind the boat for as long as it takes to fill it up with vegetation, which is usually about 10 yards. Um, we pull it up, and we look for eggs. And if you find eggs, then you figure out how many eggs are there. And then you can calculate that by how, much, how far you ran between stations. It's all geolocated now. And you can back calculate. What we're actually calculating, based on uh, techniques developed by the Canadians a long time ago, is how many herring had to be there to leave that many eggs behind. That's really how it works. And it works pretty well, um, which is somewhat surprising. Uh, this is a rake. This is from Hood Canal. This is pretty rare. But that's a herring rake full of eggs on Gracilariopsis. And then the way that we used to do this, the other way we used to do this, is called acoustic trawl. This involves two boats. You have a boat out front running with a scientific echo sounder. You're getting a, uh, readings of how many. They do it at night because the fish are up in the water column. And that schools tend to break apart. So you can actually get an account of fish. It's basically like your fish finder on your boat, but it's much more powerful. Um, and then you got to go through with a real legit fishing boat. This is an old limit saner, 62 feet, that we use at Chesina. Uh, it's in Blaine Harbor, Fairmount. And they put a net on it and make sure that it's herring, because it could be hake or some other kind of fish. And then it's usually not just herring. So if it's 60% herring, you take whatever number you had as an estimate from acoustics times 60%. That's your answer. Um, so the, we used to do both of these together. And the nice part about doing this one is you actually get your hands on some fish. When you just get rakes full of eggs, you can't measure fish. You don't get scales or odorless, or you can't tell what sex they are or the fecundity. So there's things that we are missing with our current way of doing this that make management a uh, somewhat faith-based process. When they compared these two things, the R squared, you run a regression, the R squared was really strong. 0.8 for ecological data is a very strong signal. Unfortunately, the department turned around and said, well, if it's that good a correlation, we don't need to do this anymore because this costs a lot of money. And so we just do this one now. And that was a, that was a budget crunch that, uh, you know, those things happen. But that's the decision that was made. So um, herring mortality, I need to keep moving along here. But basically, everything eats herring. Um, they have disease issues. Our colleague, Paul Hirschberg at USGS, studies two of the major diseases uh, in, the, in the Salish Sea. There's issues with toxic I'm going to talk about. As I mentioned at the beginning, with the timing of the blooms, there's an overwinter starvation issue. Uh, and then there's fishing pressure. And I can knock out the fishing pressure right now. This is our historic uh, fisheries through 2016. I can tell you the data hasn't changed much since then. The red bars are the sport bait fishery, which is just catching salmon for herring, for catching herring for salmon bait. Um, that's less than 6% over the last decade. Um, so it's a very small take. The worldwide, a, a fishery that is considered sustainable is 20% take. So we're well below that. But you can see in the 60s and 70s, we were prosecuting four to five different fisheries at the same time. Almost all that's coming from the Cherry Point area. I think that's the smoking gun for why the herring went away so quickly. The question as to why they haven't recovered remains, and that's something that we're trying to figure out. So um, tribal co-manager since 74, talked about sport bait fishery. 
and I talked about that. And the, the fisheries we do have, have are all south of Admiralty Strait, so that we're not catching cherry point fish. And we're quite confident that we're not catching cherry point fish because, again, the toxics profile tells us that those fish are from the main basin. And I think I'm leading into toxic profile slides right now. No, I'm not. Okay, we're in predation still. Hold on. Wait for it. Uh, herring, dark blue bars. This is subadult Chinook, subadult coho, large, large part of the diet, critical part of the diet. And for non fish, cool picture. Um, these are not herring. This, this is actually Manhattan on the East Coast, but very cool picture. So this is diets for harbor seals uh, up in this neck of the woods. The, this is herring, obviously a huge component. Uh, these are stickleback and trying to perch some other stuff. But herring, again, very important. Here we are with rhinoceros auklet diets. Herring are in red, very important. Notably, sand lance, which are these guys, are their favorite food item. Um, and this is a, just a quick slide showing the decline in seabirds. So if you don't have a lot of forage fish, you don't have a lot of seabirds. This is the loss since uh, from the 70s to the 90s. So these are the other group of fish, uh, birds that don't rely on fish. They've dropped about less than 25%. But these guys are all fish eaters. And you can see grebes are down over 80%. Scoters, so massive declines. So it really is, that's, that's why it's an ecosystem indicator. OK, toxics for you Simpsons fans. Um, Again, I'm going to try to move quickly through this, but um, these are some slides from our T-Bios group, Fish and Wildlife. They've been doing the studies since the late 90s. Um, these are the four sites they're talking about. So obviously Cherry Point and Semiyamu, pretty much the same area for, as far as the herring are concerned. Those guys are down here, super low levels of PCBs and steady across time. This is main basin, okay? And those, elevate, those are not dropping over time, which is concerning. Obviously, we know they're long-lived chemicals, but... Main basin fish are just loaded with toxics. And that's how we tell them apart. Uh, we can also do it genetically, but that's a really clean signal. These are some of the other toxics they're looking at, PCBs, DDTs, hydrochlorobenzene. This is the fire retardant. Um, and again, cherry point over here on the far right, considerably lower than all these other sort of main basin South Sound sites. That's good news for this area, but um, I sure wish we could do something about the main basin. OK. And then just a few slides here. <laughs> uh, this, is, this blows my mind. This is, I think, 1974 at Cherry Point. This is wind rose after a big storm event just washed all these herring eggs onto the beach. That's actually Gulf Road, by the way. Gulf Road, yep. Um, remarkable. That's what abundance looks like. By the way, I love the fact that they used to have to haul the boat on top of the car. Really glad we don't do that anymore. Um, OK, so I won't spend a ton here, but you've seen this decline. This is the, the decline of the cherry point stock in red. I'm just, I throw this up there to just show you the noise. These are all of our 21 stocks plotted out. Tons of noise, and that's, that's to be expected with forage fish. Um, over that decline, up here in 73, you can see this. the red is where the herring spawn was detected, all the way down to Portage Island, Lummi Island, all the way up, including Point Roberts. This is 82. By 90, we're seeing a contraction. Actually, they're moving, we're losing the upper portion. And then in the late 90s, they've contracted down to this tiny little spot in the middle. Um, this is Point Whitehorn. This is Birch Head. Uh, and then in 2006, and then 2014, they're basically moving from Point Whitehorn to Birch Head. Starting in 2016, we've only seen spawn at Birch Head. That's it. Uh, that's another toxic slide. Th this is um, why we're saying we don't know where they go when they're not spawning. I, w I don't have time to explain this fully, I apologize. But um, by looking at the toxics profile, we know they don't go out where all the other fish go out. What the, so what this says to us is they're probably in the Strait of Georgia year round, but where in the Strait of Georgia? And I suspect they may be up in Canada, but I don't have a way of proving that yet. Um, some age structure stuff. Uh, th this is a, these are herring scales. This is how we tell the age. We can also use otoliths. Um, I'm going to run through this quickly because we're running short of time. But this is the age structure profiles through time. So this, this is uh, 74. You see a nice bell curve. Some eight and nine-year-old fish, very encouraging. The larger, older females tend to have more eggs, higher fecundity. As they move through time, you see it bouncing around. But as we get into the, this is uh, 2000, this is 2011, highly skewed to the left, meaning younger fish. We did a, uh, with funding from DNR, we did a study with gillnets. 
excuse me, 2016, 2017, don't eat pizza right before you give a talk. Um, and we're back, to, we're back to a bell curve. So some of this, I, I, this is somewhat a method of detection, but it's really nice to see that we still have some of those older fish there. Um, we had some interesting spawning events in the past year. Uh, we had a very odd time spawned right at Point Whitehorn. This is a photo from Mike McKay. Uh, this is a plume of spawn that actually wrapped around into Birch Bay. And, this, and then another event down at Sandy Point. I don't know if anyone lives down there, but they, people had herring spawn on their lawns because they spawned at high tide. Very heavy. We could not get there. We're, we're, we have a full slate of herring surveys. We got there two to three days later, and because of all the bird predation, that was already heavily grazed down to like a medium level of spawn, which is a very different thing from a, a heavy level of spawn. It's logarithmic scale. Um, Okay, so I want to throw this in there because this question has been asked a lot in the last year. Can we jumpstart herring to revitalize Puget Sound? Well, the thing to remember is everything has to have something to eat, right? We talked about how quickly they can starve to death, bloom timing, things like that. So there's been talk of, among other things, herring hatcheries and net pens. <laughs> I have to say I'm very much against that, for, uh, mainly because of the disease issues. When you put fish in high densities together, you have massive disease problems. But it took us 20 years of research to learn how to grow salmon in hatcheries, because for the first 20 years, they just all died of disease. Um, but also, there's been a cost analysis. The, the Canadians have been doing herring work intensely, much longer than we have. And it's a, a commercial fishery that brings in a lot of money. So there's a lot of money directed at the research. Um, they looked into this and decided it was not cost effective. The other thing is to increase spawning habitat, shoreline. Um, right now, herring are not habitat limited in our neck of the woods but there's always the threat of destroying habitat. So I showed you those spawning maps. And like I said, there's lots of habitat, but the fish spawn where they want to spawn. And if you put up a giant seawall there, that destroys the habitat. They don't just spawn 100 yards down the beach. Sometimes they just disappear, and we don't know what happens to them. Um, DFO has tried to transplant stocks to new grounds, which is what the, um, a lot of the tribal oral histories talk about putting in hemlock boughs and letting this egg sp the herring spawn on them and then moving them to new locations. I think that's possible, but you know, they tried to do it for four years and it didn't work. Um, and then reducing egg predation. And this is something where we just put a grant in yesterday with uh, Catherine Sobosinski at Western Washington. We're trying to get funding to investigate what happens if we reduce seabird predation on the herring eggs at Cherry Point. Because this to me is the least intrusive way of trying to solve this problem. Um, it's just let the herring spawn naturally cover the eggs with some netting, and then hopefully you'll have, you will have more egg survival. The problem is that survival of the, the larval fish is still subject to incredible mortality. Again, they have to have something to eat. The timing has to be right. If that doesn't work, you could have all the eggs in the world hatch out and they'll still all die. I sound pessimistic, but that's, that's just how it works. Um, so I'm, that was really the one I wanted to talk about in terms of our projects. I'm going to run through that. This is a slide showing that, egg, that avian, as in bird predation, is really, really significant at Cherry Point, but not, not in some of the other sites they looked. And this is because that they've contracted their spawning range now so small. It's very intense spawn in a very small area, and that means the birds can just hammer it. And so I think the avian bird thing is a real phenomenon up here. Uh, this is some anchovy data. I just wanted to mention that Anchovy, since the blob, anchovy have come up in abundance quite a bit. We don't know how much because we don't usually look at anchovy, but it's clear that their numbers have increased. And this is one of the things we have to keep in mind. Well, everyone always says, well, when are we going to recover the herring? I'm all for that, but realize that there's a bunch of other things in the ecosystem that are willing to take that space. So if you fish out the herring, maybe we've got more anchovy now, and they're competing for the same food source. So it's not a simple plug and play, pick your favorite species equation. They do, um, more or less. Anchovies actually have finer gill rakers, so as they swim through the water, they can catch smaller stuff. So they're slightly different, but there's a lot of overlap. So they're definitely competing, especially when the herring are small. Um, so this is my climate change slide. How are we doing in time? I know I'm over. Are we badly over? <laughs> OK. I'm, I will run through this, and then we'll be done. Um, anyway, these are the concerns long term with climate. Obviously, the, wa the water's warming, so if you're a fish, that's a problem because warmer water holds less oxygen. That's chemistry. Um, and of course, the fish's metabolic rate is running faster, so they have to eat more to keep up with that expenditure. Um, the other one is food web 
timing mismatches. This is what we talked about with the balloon timing. They've got five days they gotta find food. If, if the world gets warmer earlier and the phytoplankton bloom earlier, then when the herring hatch out, they either may or may not have any food. And that timing is critical. So those shifts are important. Hang on to that for one sec. Um, and then ecosystem shifts, we talked about maybe there's more anchovy. We, evidence suggests there's more jellies now than there used to be, and jellyfish are competing for food with forage fish. And jellyfish are considered a dead end because if you eat a jellyfish, you get very little nutrients out of that. So that's, that's an issue that's being tracked now. Um, and then ocean acidification. I touched that at the beginning, but this is really the, uh, it affects a lot of things, including fish behavior. O oddly enough, uh, f fish from the tropics have, they've now demonstrated that their changes in acidity modify fish behavior, which uh, they don't know how that works yet, but I find that interesting. That has not been shown for temporal species. Um, and then, of course, the, but the, the zooplankton ability to uptake calcium carbonate from the water is changed by the acidity. So if the acidity goes up, that process gets harder. That's the food source for everything. So that one is certainly troubling. Okay, I think that's it for my slides. Uh, I do have a short video. It's one minute. This is fun. We gotta watch this, hold on. Uh, what else is open? Here we go. I watch this all the time. Those are scales in the water. Yeah. We're going to need to dust them What's the fruit fish like? I think it's herring. Oh! Is that fast fish? That's real. That's real. That's real. That's real. That's real. That's real. Yeah, so this is off the BBC, and um, of course, with David Attenborough. Um, the rumor behind that was there were divers in the water. The, there were two divers in the water. One guy was out further away. And the, the first part with the bait ball, the guy's in there filming the bait ball and the bird is, you know, super cool. He didn't see the whale coming. So the guy who was farther away caught the whale come up right next to him and apparently scared the hell out of him. But fortunately, whales don't need people. All right. Okay. So that's it. How are we doing? Yeah, a couple of questions. Yeah. If you have a little, would you address the importance of Fraser River copepod to two-year-old, two-year-old uh, first spawner area coming off the Cherry Point grounds? Say that again. Fraser River copepod. Copepod plume. Okay. Uh, the importance of that as a food source for the two-year-old herring spawners coming, uh, first-time spawners yeah. coming off of Cherry Point grounds. Yeah, that's. Potentially that's, uh, so the cherry point herring, because they spawn later in the year, herring don't eat for like a month before they spawn. They put all their energy into egg production. So they're losing a really critical period of the year because there's a lot of food in the spring uh, in order to spawn late. And so the question is, how do they then survive the winter if they're missing out on that? And one of the answers is potentially the copepod plume that Michael just talked about. The other theory, I don't know if you've heard me say this before, but Doug Hay, who's retired herring biologist at DFO, you know, 35 years of, He's, he's a, a, a wise herring person. Oh, yeah. I call him all the time. His theory is that the Cherry Point adults are actually going into the Fraser River in the saltwater wedge and feeding on juvenile chum and pink salmon when they're that big. Oh, really? Because they're just little balls of fat with a giant yolk sac, yeah. and that's how they do it. And we're actually gonna try and test that this year. We're gonna try and go up and catch some fish and then run genetics. And I love the idea that herring are eating salmon, even though, you know, <laughs> payback. Payback, people. It's hard out there for a herring. Okay, maybe one more question? And your question about the timing at Cherry Point, if you want to see me afterward, I actually have a slide sort of talking about when the, when the terminals went in and stuff like that, but you know, it's just, it's not a clear signal. Anybody else? Yes. Could you repeat the first part? Oh, the turns. 
um, you know, the terns come through, but they don't stick around. Like the, the scoters are actually coming in and timing their migration for the herring spawn. And there's actually a really cool paper, it's about, the, they call it the silver wave. The silver wave is the herring spawn. So they, they spawn, they start in California earlier because the water's warming up earlier. And up in Alaska, they're spawning in August, right? So the birds actually timing their migration to follow the herring up the coast. It's pretty cool. Um, but I haven't heard much about terns. I mean, they, they do eat fish, but I, they're never listed as one of the culprits. Yeah, one more, last one. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All that's true. Um, part of it's detection capability. I think that we're we're seeing more viruses that we didn't have a way of checking uh, as as sensitively before. Um, we give Paul Herring every year for him to, to scan the juvenile fish. The juveniles tend to be hit harder by the viruses than the older fish. The big one here for Herring is an infectious hematopoietic necrosis virus, which sounds horrible if you think about that. Um, but anyway, that, that is, it's always here, but it's been at a low level. And every once in a while we get these breakouts and that's typically uh, the theory is that's a stressful event, like a super warm water event, like the blob years can trigger that kind of thing. He didn't report any massive uh, increases due to that, but, and that's the one, that's the one really where if you put them in a pen to make them spawn, that, that just, they call it breaking with the virus. It's basically an outbreak, like a, I don't, like Ebola is a little over dramatic, but that's the scenario. You can have like 70% mortality, so. All right, I'm done, thank you.